Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Growing Up in Scientology. We have our first three-way conference being recorded, and I'm super excited about it. We have Mike Laws coming back for a second round, and we're now being joined by Janice Gillum Grady. Say hi, Janice. Hi, guys. <laughs> so, um, uh, yesterday we recorded an interview with, uh, with Mike, and uh, we discussed what Mike has done to help people transition from their life in the Sea Org to life in the real world. And in that video, he mentioned Janice. And um, by the way, Janice has also um, written a book recently. Janice, uh, the, uh, give me the name of the book again. Commodore's Messenger, A Child Adrift in the Scientology Sea Organization. That's right. So this book is incredible. I'm just going to do a quick plug before we begin. Um, I've read many of the books that have been written by people who were up at international management. I read one of Marty Rathbun's books. I read Jeff Hawkins' book. I've read Mark Headley's book. I've read, um, uh, I, I'm leaving some out. But yours is the first one that I've read that goes into tons of detail about the time you spent with L. Ron Hubbard, which to me as someone who grew up in Scientology was so fascinating. Um, and I, I highly recommend it to everyone. So, and also, so Janice, you yourself, um, I don't want to even try to recap your story because that's not really possible. Mm -hmm. But you were in the Sea Org for a very long time. You were you were born in Scientology. You're like third generation Scientologist. Am I right? Third generation. Second, second generation. Okay, it's second. There's so much information about in your book about your extended family. I, <laughs> um, uh, but then when you did leave the Sea Org, and and you yourself had your own struggles acclimating to the real world, you at the same time helped many other people walk that path and make it as easy for them as possible. And even though we haven't put together any talking points for what we're going to discuss here, uh, that's pretty much going to be the gist. I mean, Mike, I'm, I, I might leave it more up to, to you to sort of uh, ask Janice here what you'd like to have her explain to people about the challenges of assisting people with this transition, um, what to focus on, tips tips to give people. Because between the two of you, um, no one's done more of that. No one that I know of, at least, has done more of that than you guys. Um, well, again, I don't know that Janice and I ever, nobody's done more. Janice has done more quite a bit. But uh, a little bit of important business first. Janice, yesterday, the most important question was not suitably answered, which is, was Aaron right or wrong when he said, <laughs> There is a network of hundreds of people standing ready for people to come out of this talk. And, um, and you said? And I'm not sure that the wording is. No, no, don't poison her answer. Don't poison her answer. <laughs> okay, Janice, what's yours? You know, there's what do you many, think? I would say there's hundreds of people that are willing to help. But when it comes to the time of actually helping and opening their door, there's not hundreds, but there are enough to help those that need to be helped. And there are hundreds that would probably contribute money-wise to help. And there's a handful that can help get jobs. And it depends what kind of jobs those people need. Yeah. So who wins? There's no winners. There's only people getting help. There's only people getting help. Okay. And people who need, and people who need help. But okay. Mike, I hope you don't mind if I leave um, most of the questions up to you because I'm more, I'm just as interested to know what you would like Janice to share. Right. Um, you know what I mean? Okay. And, and one more point. Mike, you're, you're uh, frozen. Sometimes, sometimes it freezes. Go ahead. Uh, say it again, Mike. We couldn't hear what you said. Okay. Your, the statement that you made as you made it is like a network of three billion people on this planet that want world peace. It's technically true. Yeah. But what, what do you do with it? Um, at, at, in, in that form. So anyway, I, I, I just, I broke out the dictionary 
to try and figure out what network means and what group means in normal English. And anyway, I just had to give Aaron a little bit of shit about that because he was really wanting to quit this. Very important to it. Well, and again, I'm not... <laughs> it, it, the, the, the handicap here is that it's hard for me to say anything about it without someone saying I'm just being defensive. It's right. not a matter of being right or wrong. It's a matter of are there people willing to help? And yeah. and you're right, Mike. Like You're right. You could say, well, there's 3 billion plus people who want world peace. That doesn't mean they're doing anything about it. Right. And you're right. When I say there's hundreds of people who want to help, that doesn't mean there's hundreds of people who are doing anything about it or seeking out people who need the help. And again, <clears throat> it's, it's just that you have the potential there. And so I was sort of casting a line, letting everyone know that if you ever become aware of anybody leaving the Sea Org, let us know because we can do something about it in one way, Correct. Shape, you know? Absolutely Correct. agree. Correct. Absolutely agree. And then I got one more question for you, Aaron. Where's the Emmy I keep hearing about? We spoke about that yesterday, didn't we? I, I brought it up it's to you, behind you yesterday. Oh, I know. I know why I feel like we've already discussed this. Because a few days ago, I recorded an interview with Jeff Carlson where we discuss the the Emmy. And the, I haven't published the interview yet, but I keep forgetting I haven't published it. So let me not answer that question right now because the interview is being published first thing tomorrow morning. And the answer will be there. Okay. Yeah. And is it gonna, you know, is it gonna fill the cracks for the people who are rather curious about your end? It will it will completely fill the cracks. It will fill the vacuum. It will I, finally get them to shut the fuck up. <laughs> I I I will allow you to be silent on it now, but I reserve the right to come back on and give you shit about your Emmy if it's inappropriate. Totally, totally. So but let me make the plug. The interview is gonna be with Jeff Carlson from Buffalo, New York, who in, I, okay, I won't tell, okay. Look in the Jeff Carlson interview. It's gonna be an hour and 20 minutes long and it will be published before this one comes out. So whoever's watching this interview online, the Jeff Carlson interview will already be published. Look in the last 10 minutes of the interview and it will answer the Emmy question. Okay. All right. Waiting with faith and breath. Now, so, I'm going to switch over now to uh, Janice. Um, okay. Jan Janice and I were talking earlier today. And um, if image doesn't go over, our broadband isn't working very well since the flood. So, you know, people get to look at you and you're better looking than I am anyway. Um, Janice and I were talking earlier, and we were talking about basics like being able to communicate in the real world and so on and so forth. Um, in the Sea Org, I knew Janice at the international base, and she was actually a very accomplished manager. And uh, we were talking about coming out into the real world and not even um, knowing how to speak to people. And, um, you know, she made a kind of a cute little comment, which was, how do you talk to people when you don't know anything about the real world? And, um, you know, you don't even know how to grow a tomato. How do you talk to somebody about gardening if you don't know how to grow a plant? A little bit more in line with what she had. I had a few more years outside of the Sea Org as a kid before I went in. But would you... Um, I've found a lot of issues that people have with communication, including myself. We had to learn how to communicate and, and get context in the real world. Would you care to share? You know, you also need to learn a whole new language because to me, Scientology's was my first language. So when I left at the age of 34 years old, I'm, I am so used to using Scientology terms in everything I say that suddenly I have to stop and think and go, how do you really communicate this out here so that people understand what I'm saying? And my sister and I, we used to, when people would say, you guys speak funny, we go, oh, that's just a, an Australian word. 
and <laughs> and people would kind of accept that and think that it was just some Australian slang or something when no it was Scientologies that we would we were saying but we were just so used to it and now you know even today I still have to sometimes translate uh, certain words as to what does it mean in the regular English language because there's so many great words like dev t you know how do how do you there's no English word for dev t right you know it's funny when I'm talking to other former Scientologists I don't even bother to try and figure out other words because I'm perfectly comfortable using the terminology um but if you don't know how to put it in other words it's you're definitely handicapped yeah yeah well after 34 years here i am 34 years old and yeah i've got to learn to translate the rate my regular speaking terms into english so you know that that's that's just one of the things but when when i left whenever though i'd been in the sea org for 22 years i went in at 11 years old i've been in scientology all my life and when i left you know it's like i at least had a husband who had worked you know he'd had a long job he'd gone to college he'd worked at a hospital so he had some idea of the outside world where all the only people i knew were Scientology public, very few, and mostly ex org members. And so when I came out, it's like, where do I go? I haven't seen my brother for eight years because I've been disconnected from him because he left first. My sister was in Florida. She'd left eight months before me. And there was Mike Sutter telling me, don't you contact your sister or you'll be expelled ex forever. You know, and, and at that time, you're still thinking Scientology terms and your future. You haven't started peeling that onion yet. But I went ahead and contacted her anyway. But the first person I went to was my brother because I'm like, where else do I go? My father was still in good standing. And my brother, thankfully, took me in. He, it was as if no time had passed when I showed up on his doorstep with my husband. And... Then it's like, okay, now what do I do? We have no money. And so I had these paintings, these prints from ASI that they'd been selling for $3,000 and that stupid stuff. So I had some of those. I called Marshall Goldblatt. No, actually I called some other FCCIs that I knew and asked if they would buy those from me to help me get some money. Cause here I am basically barefoot and pregnant with no job. And um, they all turned me down because I'd left the Sea Org and they refused to help. But Marshall Goldblatt stepped forward and uh, he helped me out. And um, that is what gave me some basic to springboard off of, you know, and live off of while I figured out what are we going to do. And then my husband started working construction. I started doing babysitting. You know, I was pregnant, but I didn't even know how to deal with kids. I had that sealed mentality of discipline. And then I'm like trying to help these kids make brownies. And I'm like realizing I'm being very strict with these children <laughs> because that's all I knew. <laughs> but anyway, so then I'd heard Mark Fisher had left. So I'm like, oh, okay, it's better if we get, we're in a group and we can kind of figure this all out together. So my sister came at, back from Florida. Mark Fisher came up from San Diego. And meanwhile, an ex-Scientologist calls and got our number from my, my dad and said, hey, I hear you guys have left. I'm putting a mortgage company together in Las Vegas. Do you want me to teach you the business? And that's when we all packed up and moved to Vegas. But it was that that help that was there and the people who I thought would help me were my old friends and they weren't there for me because they were still in good standing and even I when I left still had that mentality of oh my god I can't talk to her mother she's been a declared an SP because she was with David Mayo's squirrel group so there and but that is one of the people that would have stepped forward to help 
but you don't go to them because you you're thinking of your eternity being you know ruined if you dare go speak to this sp who's being so nice to you and so gradually you know that moves away and I just started calling old friends that I knew had left because we now had this opportunity and maybe it would help them. And that's when Kenny Lipton joined us and then Cheryl and Jean DeChef came and joined us. And we just started building this whole mortgage company with ex -Org members because we all needed jobs. But the, the main thing with it was it was commission and having our work, work ethics from being in the Sea Org and having to work on commission, it, it, uh, you know, that's really what helped us a lot make it. But, you know, those times we're between two of us, we're making a thousand dollars a month or something, but at least we're in a two bedroom apartment, Terry and Fernando in one room, Paul and I in one, and Mark Fisher on the couch. Uh, and, and that's how we started was as a small group. And we just started building and helping each other out and and that and you still had that withdrawal from the people in the real world it was too embarrassing to even say that you were like a martian because that's what you were you know you had no credit you had no background of any sort if anyone checked into you they'd find out you just suddenly appeared in the world at the age of 34 years old crazy so you never got any high school diploma or GED before you were 30, before you left at 34, right? No, and I still don't have it. Right. Neither do I. Uh, I, don't have one. <laughs> I don't have one either. Um, but it, it, she makes a really good point with the, um, you know, the, the struggle. For it was not easy going into the I struggled. I had a hard time assimilating. I made a lot of mistakes. Um, I wanted to make sure that people that were watching this didn't think it was going to be an you know, easy run. Maybe they'll get lucky. Maybe it will be a very easy run. But it's far more likely, in my opinion, without trying to be negative, that they're going to have to struggle. They're going to have to fight. You're going to have to work hard to, to make it happen. Sure. And I think for me personally, I realized that there seems to be some sort of a blowback in the ex Scientology community, although I'm not trying to take the reaction from just a few people and generalize it. But some blowback that somehow I and or Chris Shelton have misrepresented that it's just a piece of cake. And I guess my part, part of what I want to say to something like that is I feel like it's more constructive to point out to people the ways in which they can land on their feet than it is to just sit around talking about all the ways you can't. And, and this isn't a response to you, Mike. This is just a, a sort of a, 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 a more of a, a higher level commentary on this sort of discussion I engage in in general. Which is, you know, because a lot of time, and Janice, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. The question comes up. I saw it even come up again in the group today, um, uh, commenting on the fact that, you know, they see the show, they see these people being interviewed, they have terrible, terrible stories, and they have nice houses, and, and they have careers. Now, a couple of those houses were rented for the show for people that were coming in from out of town or out of the country, but for the most part, these shows were filmed in people's houses. And so the question keeps coming up. How is it that they're making their way? And so the answer to that question to me is how you make your way, not all the people who didn't make their way. Like uh, if the goal is to help people make their way, then what's the what should the focus of the conversation be on? I'm just sort of explaining why I talk about these subjects the way I talk about, and it's never been my intention to misrepresent whether yeah. it's easy or hard or anything like that. but. Um, no, I, I, I have no question that you had no misintention, but if you look at the most basic way human beings learn, what is the most basic way? Learning lessons the hard way, by failure. No, um, oh. it's following what other people do. Right. Copying. When you're a baby, yeah. you copy that what your parents do. As you get older, you learn 
you try and do what your parents did. You learn what people around you are doing. You're observing and execute. And when I hit the real world, one of the problems I had was I had this um, Scientology-esque view that nobody would lie. People don't lie to me. People don't misrepresent. So I'm um, looking at things and looking at people and I'm like laughing. Uh, it's okay. Um, and I'm thinking, oh, they have to be telling the truth. They have to be honest. Oh, wow, they're going to give me a big shot. Um, and you soon learn that, you know, half the time you're being calm. So in order to live in the real world, you have to figure out who do I, who do I follow? Who's good to follow? Who's safe to follow? Who's safe to observe and emulate? Because um, I, I remember when I was in L.A., I was getting all of this financial advice from people that were um, drowning in debt, and you know what I mean, and, and couldn't really make any money and couldn't get ahead. But the, they had the Scientology-esque expertise and authority on things. Well, Some of the times I had no idea what it really was about, but I couldn't see it. You know, I was helping my advice. You can go now, Janice. Well, I, I fell for the same thing because in the Sea Org, everyone is so honest or they're written up for false reporting and you don't want to have to go through ethics for a false report. So, you know, you're very honest about what you see and you're honest about your schedule and where you're going and what you're doing. And then when we come out here and we set up our own mortgage company and I'm seeing employees kind of like, why are you asking me where I'm going? You know? And it's like, well, <laughs> I'm so used to everyone knowing what I'm doing every minute of the day that, and I watch kind of stunned as these employees, I see them blatantly lying about what they're doing or what their schedule was and that type of thing. And I'm like, but I still, even seeing that, I would still fall for, you know, the scams or the cons because I just trusted people. And I thought everybody was very honest. But no, that, that's not true. And, and it's a downfall that as a person coming out into the real world, you fall into that hole, trusting people, you know, wrong financial advice or anything. But then as you get more into the wor real world, you find out that there's so many people out there that themselves are now less educated or aware of how to really react to things when you thought it was yourself. But as you learn more about the world, you actually find you're smarter than a lot of people out there because of what you've learned or the tight reins that you've operated under for so many years. Yeah. If someone were to ask me what's the single, the single biggest thing that I took from my Sea Org experience that at least translated into the real world, it would have to just be the work ethic. Right by by default like you don't have a choice if you don't you you either meet the work ethic expectations of the c org and you stay or you don't and you leave and you know the the fact of um working 110 hours a week with no expectation of receiving anything in return uh may not be healthy um but it does give you something that when you enter the real world uh, that gives you a competitive edge. I mean, honestly, I mean, I would say yeah. that, if, you know, I'd, I'd be more likely to please my employer because I'm going to be on time. Like you said, I'm always going to tell them where I am and what I'm doing. I'm probably not going to be lying. I'm not going to be calling out, uh, you know, sick on Monday after a three-day weekend. I'm not. Right. Just all these things where um, I have to assume, or maybe I should say I have assumed that that is just just the mere expectation of work and and where it's it's not okay to not be busy like like i remember when i got my first job out of the sea org i did not know what to do with myself 
for an hour during lunchtime. Like I finished eating in five minutes and I was like, what the fuck am I supposed to do now? <laughs> Walk around, stare at the wall? What, what am I supposed to do? Yeah. So, I, and that, I was gonna ask you, Janice, like what would you say, what part of your Sea Org experience translated into something of value in the real world and in which parts were just completely worthless? I, you know, I agree with you on the work eth ethics. I mean, that in the real world, that gets you places. A and putting in those long hours and it's like nothing to put in long hours. You don't even think about it twice. You just do it. And that's what we had to do to start our mortgage company from nothing. And, you know, it was all commission only or else, you know, the baby's not going to get new shoes. And, and even just nickel and diming just to survive, you know, we really had to put in financial planning and you put a little money aside so that you have enough money by the end of the month or whatever, you know, and then, you know, going in with other people to do things or, you know, save gas by carpooling. You know, five of us all in one car rather than three different cars. So those are the type of things. But there's a lot of, with Scientology, just the ethics value, you know, of one's responsibility level can take you a long way. True. Um, so Mike had told me that you were sort of, that, that the kind of help and people who are watching this have probably already seen the video Mike and I did yesterday. Mike described the kind of help that he's provided to people entering the real world, leaving Scientology, leaving the Sea Org. And he said, you pretty much came, we're doing that in the era just before him and that he sort of kind of took over from you a little bit in that regard, or, or if, if, I don't want to mischaracterize it. That's kind of the idea that I got. So, um, Janice, what would you describe as some of the biggest barriers or obstacles that you encountered in trying to help people assimilate into the real world or get on their own feet, you know? Yeah, well, the biggest thing, well, they start off, at, of course, with nothing, you know. So the big, you, first thing you got to do is give them a bed and give them some food. And, you know, like Jeff Walker shows up at our door, uh, you know, and all he knows how to do is audit. You know, he's a class 12 auditor and that's what he's been doing that. Oh, but he was an engineer on the ship, but that was, that's what he knew was auditing, you know? So we trained him on how to be a loan officer. We trained him, you know, when I left, I couldn't tell you what a mortgage was. I had no idea that people borrowed money to buy a house, you know? So the, I had to learn all that and we had to teach Jeff that and Kenny that and, you know, Anyone who joined us, we taught them all those basic things so that they could then sit down and do a loan. And what came in handy was drills. You know, having done TRs and so forth, now you got to take a loan application and you don't even know how to answer half the questions on it. So you drill with each other, you know, and having been in it together and being with someone else, you're not embarrassed or ashamed of your ignorance because they're just as ignorant as you. Right. You know, where if I went to somebody else on the outside and I said, well, what's a mortgage? I would, I would feel embarrassed about that. But now that I'm more experienced with the real world, there's a lot of people who don't know what a mortgage is. So I don't know what I was embarrassed about in the first place, but I just didn't know. So, you know, you just got to learn the very basic things. You got to learn how to write a check. You got to learn how to get a credit card and what to use it for. And that you have to pay it off every month, you know, or at least make payments. And these are all things you just don't experience when you grow up inside the Sea Org. Right. That's so funny that you mentioned that whole not being embarrassed to ask questions. That's something I've experienced as well. Um, in... Scientology, you are expected to be very, very upfront about things you don't understand. In fact, it's an offense to go buy something and pretend you understand it when you don't. Right. And I remember one time when I was between jobs, 
I was like, what am I going to do? I went and I took one of these 40 hour life, health and annuities licensing classes and, um, you know, life insurance, health insurance and annuities. And there must've been 50 people in the class. I was the only one asking questions. And then when we would take a break, people would come up to me and be like, keep asking those questions, please. God, I don't understand <laughs> what you're saying. <laughs> and I'm like, why are you here if you're not trying to understand? But again, I'm not trying to mischaracterize it. Like Scientologists try to understand things and non-Scientologists don't. No, I think there's a societal thing where people are embarrassed to admit they don't know something. And it's it's so funny that you pointed that out. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, so... I ask for me, one of the things... Oh, may I speak? Yeah, no, because your connection is bad, sometimes we can't tell when you're talking or not. Absolutely, go ahead, please. One, one of the things that was really important to me, and it, it's very, very subtle, and Janice and I were talking, we've talked about it probably 20 times in the past five years. I had to, at, at one point I rejected everything from my Scientology and sealed back. I don't want anything to do with it. And at other at other times I was trying to completely embrace it, you know, especially when I first came out. What I really had to figure out how to, to <clears throat> determine was what were the real usable skills that I had from the real, from the psychology world that I could bring into the real world, you know, if I completely rejected everything Scientology, I was rejecting everything in my life. It was impossible for me to know what was me or what was Scientology because I was born and raised. But I had to take skills and then measure it against how it worked in the real world, how other people responded. Did, did you have anything like that, Janice? <laughs> well, you know, when I left, you know, I'd been in management for all these years. So, of course, you know, stats were drilled into my head. <laughs> so here we are setting up a mortgage company and we start trying to operate on daily stats and, and weekly stats and stat graphs and trends and and putting in admin functions and to try and make things smoother. Finally, we went to hell with all this. Let's just, you know, do a loan, go out and get a loan. Who cares if you had one this week and zero, just go get a loan. It doesn't matter. No one's gonna be coming down on us. No mission's gonna be fired in to kick our butts to make us get to work, it's up to us. But we didn't need a stat trend to tell us whether we're gonna get a paycheck or not. But, and then moving away from that, it was like so much easier not having to worry about statistics. So isn't it funny that in what, 20 or 30 years that you spent using statistics and conditions formulas every day of your life, it probably never occurred to you, this does not work. And then the moment you've got to do something in the real world, you're like, fuck this. <laughs> it became a waste of, it was a total waste of time. <laughs> it's true, it's true. It is. It's it, looking at in, in hindsight, it's one of these, it's one of these blind spots that you're like, how did we ever think operating on one week statistical trends was ever positive? Like, how did, how did that not blow up the whole organization on that alone? Just people going, yeah, this doesn't work. Everyone yeah. thinks it works. Everyone's convinced themselves it works. And it was such a waste of time sitting there counting everything, you know, and it's like, I could be getting a lot more done if I didn't worry about the stats and just worried about getting things done that would result in income so I can pay my rent. Right. What, what, what other things did you run into like that, like what Mike was talking about, where you had to kind of figure out what part of this whole knowledge base from Scientology you were going to continue to use and what part you were going to get rid of? Oh, what else? Um, Mike, help me out with some thoughts here. Well, what, you know, basic things like the, um, the, the comm cycle. Oh, yes. Uh, you know, different, everyone has to communicate in a 
certain way and getting upset with people if they didn't give you a proper acknowledgement or things like that, becoming a little more casual, a little more intuitive with people. Well, yeah, you know, I, I had a lot of people when we first came out feel I was too intense. And, and I know that that's, you know, I still get intense. Um, my kids are like, calm down, mom. And I'm like, I am calm. But <laughs> yeah, I feel I'm calm, but they think I'm getting roused up, you know. But they've never seen me when I really get going. So I've had to keep myself calm down when I first left because if things didn't get, I had to have things done right away. And I still do that. If I think, oh, I've got to get blah, blah done or go to the bank. If I don't get it done that day, I'm like, I'm not getting done things I need to do because I've still got that keep goingness in my head. And um, I found that with raising the children, there's time you just got to go, wait a minute, slow down. You can, you can relax. There's time. You don't have to feel guilty for not working. You know, take some time, go watch a soccer game. You know, even my husband, he'd be sitting there reading the paper during a soccer game while my son's playing. The coach is like, why does he even come, <laughs> you know, to read the paper? I said, no, no, He, when our son has the ball, he will look up from the paper and watch him. <laughs> but you have, you had to fit things into every spare second. Otherwise you felt you weren't producing. Definitely. Definitely. Did, uh, did you ever try and execute, uh, Janice, did you ever try and execute, make the penalties for non-compliance too gruesome to confront? Not in the outside world. <laughs> <laughs> no, and even in the Sea Org, I, you know, I kept getting in trouble in the Sea Org because LRH labeled me as worker-oriented. <laughs> Because I would always kind of protect the worker and say, well, what about them? And it's like, he was more concerned about the production and the organization. And I'm always bringing up the worker. And I remember even Amy Scobie, when she was my org officer, she used to be given programs or have to write programs to handle me so I wouldn't be worker oriented while I was in the SEALG. That's a nice that's a what? of honor to have. Edge <laughs> of honor to have. Yeah. I, um, I, I, I've had a lifelong battle since um, overcoming the mission is everything. Going after whatever the goal is, the objective, the mission, that being the, of tantamount purpose, more important than me, more important than family, more important than health, anything else. That, that's been a it's very easy for me to go into a 60, 80 hour week right. and put everything else on hold. I, I still have trouble getting out of that, even though it's been 20 years. And you know, that, that just gave me a... Go ahead. That just gave me a thought. I remember, you know, we said there was like seven of us ex Org members all at our mortgage company at one point. And gradually everyone kind of peels off to go do their own thing once they've got money or feeling more stable in the world. And um, we, we got to a point where we were going to sell the mortgage company and I decided I wanted to go off on my own. And all those years after having left, I was always with a group of other SEAL members. And here I am, I'm going off on my own. I'm gonna set up my own little mortgage company. I'm gonna hire my own loan officers. I'll do it all myself. I was keeping it small. I didn't wanna go big. I was so fed up with having to deal with all these employees and having to watch my back, you know, because you couldn't trust what some of those loan officers might do. So I went off on my own. And I remember every day when I drove into work, I'd be telling myself, I can do this. 
And these little doubts would kind of creep in and I'm like pushing those doubts out and I'm going, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. And I'd run through my head everything that I needed to do in order to finish the setup and make sure that I got promotion going and make sure I got at least one loan application in to at least have some money to cover while I still was, was building up. But I think that daily telling myself as I drove to work to my little office by myself, I can do this. That was a big push for myself, just believing in me. Yeah, and, and for me too. I also had questions on, you know, can I do it? Am I really this good? Am I lying to myself? Am I, am I really as bad as I'm being told by the church? Um, you know, things like that were, were, were always something that I had to work to overcome. And I would try and focus on other things than that to push myself through. Right, right. Now, now I just, I don't even tell myself I can do it. I just know I can do it and go and do it. You know, but it, it took a while of, you know, pulling away from everybody on your own and just going, I can do this. And what, what, exactly. And what do you think, out of curiosity, I thought of this as you were mentioning, when if you get sick, PTS, or if you have an accident, or if something goes wrong, do you still ever get the old programming that you're pulling it in your out ethics, or can you push that? Well, I, I think more along the line of what's going on in my universe that this is happening. Yeah. I don't go into a, what did I do, but more of a, what's going on to try and just pull everything and stabilize things rather than, I don't blame myself anymore as to what did I do to pull it in. That, that's a good way of wording it. I mean, same here. I remember, I clearly remember the first few years I'd get sick or something would go wrong, or I'd make a mistake, and I'd start introverting, climbing right. into my head, to try and think do. Uh, even when people don't talk about it, and they know it's not true, there's sometimes a tendency to at least feel it in your gut, feel uncomfortable. Sometimes it's just you're, you're sick. One right. of the things I have to learn is that shit just goes wrong. There's good luck, there's bad luck. You can influence good luck and bad luck to a degree, but to a certain degree, we're along for a ride. We can't control everything. Right, but when I, there is bad luck, I do look at things and go, what can I do to change this or to improve the situation that I'm in? I do right. look at that. So do I. Yeah. yeah, I don't I just... just one, oh, I'm sorry. Karen. No, go on. Well, I think it's just one of these concepts where there's a happy medium and then there's extremes on either ends. And um, just to generalize for a moment, I do feel that in society at large, there is a lot of, um, I can't do anything about that. It has nothing to do with me. I'm just the effect of things that happen to me. And then there's the other end of the spectrum, which is, you are absolutely responsible for anything that ever happens to you. And then there's what I think is a healthy exercise of no matter what's happening at any given time, can you bring yourself to examine what's going on and ask yourself, is there anything you could have done differently to make that better without blaming yourself and guilting yourself and excusing bad behavior on, on behalf of other people? I've, I always thought it was just a healthy exercise to <laughs> examine it, like what you're talking about. What, what can I... What? What could I have done differently? What could I do in the future? You know, that kind of stuff. Right. Well, sometimes if you realize you can't change something, then you better just change your attitude. Great point. Yeah. Yeah. There's someone you don't like, then you better change your attitude because if they're always going to be there working for you or something. So change your attitude towards them and things will go better. <laughs> um. Let me throw a question at you, Janice, and Mike, I'd love to know your thoughts on this as well. Um, for so many people, what keeps them from 
walking away from the abuses they're seeing and experiencing in Scientology. Is this belief in full OT and that we're in a prison planet and that there's only one brief breath in eternity to finally go free? And Janice, only because what you've written in your book about, you know, having worked with LRH, what, six hours a day, every day for six years or whatever it was, I know how connected I was to that concept of full OT. I feel like I can't even imagine how connected you were to that concept because of how close you were to LRH. How were you able to turn that corner and kind of put that behind you and not feel like you were throwing away your eternity? Well, when I left, I did feel I was throwing away my eternity unless I, I went out and quickly did an A to E and paid off my freeloader debt. But then once I got out and I was like, suddenly I felt some freedom and no hounding on me. It was like, wow, this is different. Well, let me, then my priority became making income and then raising the children. And then you kind of, as the onion slowly peels, as the time goes by, you realize that <clears throat> they don't have all the answers. There's a lot of other places that have more answers than they do. A lot of more beliefs and things like that. Um, but when you're in there, it's that whole, it's a mindset that everybody has. And you grow up with that mindset. And, and you believe in what you're doing. But there's also, and I know that the people in there that have been in there a long time have it, where there's that doubt on, I'm so I'm such and such, you know, years old, like 60 years old. If I go out there, what am I going to do as a 60 year old? You know, when you're in there, you're being told, oh, so and so failed out there. They're just flipping hamburgers or, oh, this other person couldn't make it. So they've come back in, you know, and you hear of the different failures, but you don't hear of the people who and there's a lot of people who when they left, they made it. You know, I mean, you look at Mike, myself, you, you know, we're making it and we're creating it and we're doing better than if we'd stayed in there. And by being in the positions we're in, we can still be with that original purpose of helping other people. We don't have to be in the Sea Org to help other people. Right. How many, um, did you do any OT levels in the Sea Org? Yes. Well, being born in it, you know, I was raised with auditing. And when we went to St. Hill, I did up to grade four. And then on the ship, in the early years, I did my power, my five and five A, power and power plus. Then I didn't want any more auditing. I was, I was happy. I <coughs> didn't feel I had to do the clearing course. I didn't feel I needed to do the OT levels. I watched other people who were OTs and I felt I was more capable than they were. And I was just happy with who I was. I didn't need to change anything. I could deal with the power. You know, I could communicate with anybody on the ship. I didn't have problems. You know, I didn't go committing overts and that type of thing. So I was happy with who I was. And they kept trying to get me to do more of the bridge. And I kept avoiding it. And then finally, I think when I was about 19 years old, I was like, they're never going to leave me alone because it's their job to get me up the bridge. So I finally settled down and did R6EW in the clearing course. This is all before Ned, for o Ned. And then I did um, up through old OT7. And I actually enjoyed those old OT levels. I had fun with those. They were more of exploring yourself as an OT rather than now with all the OT3 the knots and solo knots, that's all different to what the original o OT levels were after three. So I had fun with those and I have done knots and um, yeah, but I haven't done OT8. Interesting. You know, you mentioned actually, uh, let, let me, um, before I say anything further, Mike, what, what was, how did that work for you? How were you able to, how attached were you to that concept of, this is my only brief breath in eternity to get my, to go spiritually free. And did that keep you sucked in for a long time? And if so, how did you get past that? Um, I, if I'm really honest about it, 
I didn't think I got the gains that other people got. I kind of wondered if I didn't get gains, there was something wrong with me. I could pretend, I could write a success story, I could get my needle to float, but I didn't actually get the wins that I saw all of these other people getting. I couldn't really recall a past life. <clears throat> I, so my focus was more on, on the group, on helping, on saving the planet, being part of the most important team in the history of the universe. Um, and it was so embracive to me, especially losing my family and my friends, that I got good back in good standing after the Sea Org. I paid off my freeloaded bit. I did my amendments and contracts. And um, then, you know, there was this never-ending pressure to buy more and more. And I figured out the perfect answer, which was, I'm clear. I've done this training, but I'm not winning at this level of, of life. So I need to go back right now and get myself up to the level that I should be at because of this auditing and this training. I'm not ready for having brought my life far enough. And I convinced many, many registrars to leave me alone if I was working. <laughs> it's the best uh, stop for um, <coughs> how to get yourself out of the hot seat that I've come across. But the one that broke it for me was actually going to a Tony Robbins seminar, walking across the bed of hot coals. And when I did that, um, when I went to the seminar, I realized there's other people trying to help. There's other bodies of knowledge that are useful to try and make your life better. And that to me was what broke it. And then even breaking it, I still had such a horribly strong, strong draw to go back and get more auditing and thinking that auditing was the only way to improve my life, that I actually went to my doctor and got prescribed a, um, I did research to make sure that you know, it didn't have a lot of side effects, but an antidepressant. Well, butrin, it was to stop smoking, but it was an antidepressant. And um, I knew that it, if I took that pill, all of a sudden I was an illegal PC and I could never go back. And I had to do that for myself to break that, um, that draw, that, that, that suction pack. And uh, I, I still, you know, I had that bottle on my kitchen counter for weeks before I could take the first one <laughs> because it was equally terrifying. Maybe I will go insane if I do that. Maybe I will kill myself, you know. I didn't know, but I had to break it off. Otherwise, I was afraid I was going to go back. Wow. That's yeah. incredible. Something Janice said um, really rang true for me. Uh, <clears throat> I had I did had a lot of auditing in Scientology, but not bridge auditing. You know, there's all sorts of auditing you can do. Only so much of it is actually on the bridge to total freedom. I'm a pure of completion, and I didn't even do that until I was like 20, 22, right? Um, I've, I've done a couple grade quads just for the hell of it. I've never done any grades. I've never done objectives. I've never done a drug rundown. I've never attested to clear past life or otherwise. When I did the keto life course, which usually requires a drug handling, I'd never taken any drugs. And my OCA was above the center line. So they're like, okay, he doesn't have to do a drug handling. And then I never, never went back and did it. But, but that, that's leading up to my main point, which is, all of these public Scientologists that I would see who were OT four, five, six, seven, eight, I was like, these guys are kind of incompetent. You know, like <laughs> it was that concept of being able to compare myself, who had not done any bridge, to these people who had done all the bridge. That's what allowed me to go, you know, I do believe in this full OT stuff. 
and I'm like glued to the mystery sandwich of it all. But I'm not that interested in getting the auditing. Like if if what that's going to give me is what these guys got, then no thanks. I already feel like I'm better off than these guys are. But I'll tell you, I was still absolutely stuck to this concept of full OT. There's one particular incident I recall. You guys know Shane Brockdorf from Australia? Yeah. No, I don't. He was, when I was training at Flag, he was the senior CS in training for AOLA Anzo. And um, he. AOSH Anzo. Of course, AOSH Anzo. H. Um, <laughs> For some reason, he was allowed to finish his OT5 while he was on the program. I think it's because they couldn't fire a Nazi S back without finishing OT5. It would be too weird. And I just remember Shane Brockdor finishes OT5. He gets up in front of all the Adderwood trainees, and he's trying to – you know, no one's allowed to – it's all confidential, so they can never say what they did. But he's like, every single not session is like a huge bulldozer just – moving so much case out of the way and every session gave me more gain than the entire um, lower part of the bridge combined. And I'm just sitting here thinking, that is so incredible and amazing, I can't even fathom it. And it's almost driving me insane to try to sit here and figure out what that could be about, what the subject matter could be, how that could feel. So on the one hand, my expectations are being built up so high, it's like, un it's unbelievable. On the other hand, I'm seeing in the real world that none of these people seem to be more competent than I am. And then, uh, so you have that sort of building up. And then when I finally sort of started to look around on the internet after 2009, the St. Pete run, uh, Truth Rundown series, when I saw what the actual content of the OT levels were, the body things and the thing clusters, it's not that I thought that was too insane. It's I was like, Oh, that's the fucking mystery. Fuck that bullshit. I was like, that might be fine and dandy, and people might find that helpful, but that it was such a disappointment that it didn't. Set, it, it wasn't magical enough. It didn't seem powerful enough. That for me is how I was able to put it in mind because it was thirty years of built up expectation. I mean, Mike, did you do OT levels in Scientology? No. Okay. No, I, I was similar to you. I had uh, what one of the things that I kind of figured out for myself was um, state checking, security checking, enforced confessionals, and um, enforced false purpose, evil purpose, security checking. Uh, I kind of realized that it was a great way to create rapid onset Stockholm syndrome. Can you say it again? Um, your connection is bad, and I'm, I, I think that was important. OK. Intensive, uh, high-pressure security checking, which is a forced confessional, I believe creates rapid-onset Stockholm syndrome. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And so, you know, that's, I think, part of the trap that keeps you in. You know, a big difference between what I hear goes on today or the last 30, 40 years for staff and the days on the ship. On the ship, Hubbard would oversee the CSing of the crew. So he was always checking in to see if the crew are getting audited. If they're not getting audited, then how about they start doing a co-audit? And it was all about the crew's cases because we didn't have FCCIs. Or if we did, we had maybe five. Can you define FCCI? I think it's the second time we've used that word. Oh, that's the um, flag case completion intensive. Or flag case course and internship? No. Nope. Isn't because no. isn't, uh, isn't FCCI at one in one definition of it? It's a it's an actual action. But isn't the other definition just like a flag public? Well, yeah, it was flag public. But the, the, the term was FCCI. It actually was FCCI, and then it got generalized to just be anyone in flag. It was a flag, flag case completion, and the FCCIs came, they were public, they came to the ship to get auditing because it was their money that kept the ship alive and gave us bonuses, but we didn't have a lot of room for them. 
So there might have been a handful of them sitting around in the B-deck foyer waiting for their sessions. And of course, the crew always looked at them as dilettantes, you know, because they were just here to handle their case, where the rest of us were there to do a bigger job than them. But we didn't really look at the fact that it was their money that kept us going and paid us and, you know, kept us afloat. But because there being so few SCCIs, the HGC, where the tech, the auditors were, their priority was taking people into session and, and moving people up the bridge. And Hubbard, every now and again, he would check on the statistics to see how many staff have completed what grades and that type of thing. And he would keep directing to move them up the bridge. And if he found someone in ethics trouble, he would order their PC folders to be fully reviewed for any errors because he felt that there was out tech before out ethics. So it was a very different view, not a lot of set checking. The sec checking, yeah, if you're going on leave of absence or you're coming back, you got a sec check. Other than that, sec checks were not a common thing when we were on the ship. It, you know, it just wasn't. It was more of people were doing opera by dupe and the objectives and going doing their grades and di a lot of dynetic auditing. Uh, but yeah, so, the crew went up the bridge. So this point that Mike made about this in intensive sec checking, intensive focus on what have you done, what have you done, what have you done, what have you done, it leads to rapid onset um, Stockholm Syndrome. Is your point that that wasn't necessarily as common back then? Correct, correct. You know, going, going on leave sec checks and coming back from leave sec checks didn't even exist until 1974. And I'll tell you why I think it was put in. My sister and I went on leave, our three-week leave to the U.S. to see our parents. And I, you know, we'd gone the year before while Hubbard was in New York. And before that, we'd been on the ship for five years. We'd never a leave of absence in five years. We just lived on the ship. And so now Hubbard has recognized that we've gone on leave and we've seen our parents and we've come back. And we're back on duty running messages for him six hours a day. Neither of us are in trouble, but I th we then are ordered into sec check to find, and the sec check was along the line of, did we want to leave? So he probably thought that we were, we'd seen our parents. Maybe we wanted to go back and be with our parents rather than away from our, our parents and staying on the ship. And that was the start of the going on leave and returning from leave sec checks was because we'd come back and I'm pretty sure he wanted to know if we had intentions of trying to go back to our parents. Wow. I guess I'm just so naive. I don't under, why wouldn't he just sit you down and ask you that fucking question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Baron? yeah. Okay, look at this. Can you see this? <gasps> no, stop. <laughs> okay, look. Okay, see here? It's honestly a little hard for me to see, but I, it okay. might be. Read it out, Mike. Okay. It is FCCI Flag Case Completion Intensive BTB 22 October 72. Janice was right. Aaron. It only gives one definition in the dictionary? Yep, that's all that's in the... Um... Because and when that dictionary was done, that's all it meant. I've never heard what you said yeah. before. No, 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 it's funny. When I, by the time um, I got to flag, they were still using... Again, you guys were on the flagship. Um, they were still using FCCI as the term for a flag public, but they had, re, they had renamed it flag, case, course, and internship because they figured... Those are the only three things any public at Flag were doing. They were either there handling their case, or they were there on course, or they were there doing an internship. So it just, right. but it, but it's still the same. It's still the same word being used the same way. Yeah, I, I remember arriving at the. So if 
DCI mean? I was told, and then I said, that doesn't make sense. And then I was explained that it's a historical term, and yes, it's not really relevant. So I guess somebody tried to fix it after our time. Yeah, I guess, I guess. Um, what, what else, uh, well, Mike, what other, what, uh, Mike, based on your experience, what other parts of Janice's experience would you like her to share with us? Um, one, one of the comments just, you know, that, that, that I have on Janice is she's, um, I'm going to go to her book. One of the most important questions for me personally on the whole Scientology experience, on the subject of Scientology and the subject of Harvard, I never met Harvard, is what, what, what was I into? I, I kind of came to grips with the concept that I had wasted my life, I had harmed people, I had done bad things and, and, and so on and so forth, but I didn't want to believe that the whole thing was a con from the beginning. I could handle that it wound up being negative and not good and, and not valuable, but I wanted to at least think the help and the intent of people was genuine. And, um, one of the things that I've really enjoyed about Janice, both as a friend and her book, is, is she put a lot of a lot of stuff down and it's not it's not biased. It's just as it happened. You know, um, and Janice has kind of helped save my sanity a number of times where I'm like, this is all fucked up and you know, I you know. What do I do? How do I live? What do I? Blah. And uh, you know, she's she's been she's been a very calming source. I haven't seen her get unglued. I kind of would like to. I think it would be quite entertaining. Not gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> that was my old days. Yeah, but even at in base, I don't remember you getting unglued. No, I, I rarely got unglued. I tried not to. I saw it too much with others. Right. But, um, you know, you, Janice made a comment earlier on, on adjust your attitude. We can't really change what has happened. We can't change where we're at in life. We can't change the amount of time we lost. We can change what it means to us. We can change the... the, the, the the meaning and the influence and the lessons that we take from whatever we've run into in the past. And um, I want to, I need to sometimes take positive things out of very negative situations. Um, one of the things that I had, I did was um, when I started to realize that the work that I did in RTC on Intel and external influence, handling was very harmful to people. Um, as I began to get more educated, I tried to contact everyone that I knew that I had been involved with, where I had been involved with a project that harmed them. And um, I just wanted to talk to them. Some of them I met, most of them I just talked to. And Janice is probably the most brilliant networker in the entire um, X community. And she helped me hook up with a lot of the people um, who I had harmed. And, you know, I wanted to apologize. I wanted to talk to them. And I wanted to find out if there was anything I could do to help make it right. I was really amazed at the graciousness of a lot of those people. Um, one of them, a um, guy by the name of Robert Scott, we put in jail. We destroyed his life. And I called him up and he was, he was very gracious and um, understanding. He just wanted to know what happened. Um, he wanted some information. And um, 
what I knew I told him, but one of the things that I thought was really fascinating is the more people I talked to, I didn't know nearly as much as I thought I did. Um, there's a lot of compartmentalization. We were fed and controlled with very specific areas of information. So the, the recovery process for me was broadening my understanding of what happened. Um, that's not asking Janice a question. That's just saying that she's pretty fucking cool. Well, you know, Mike, oh. also you got to recognize with people when they leave the Sea Org, they're not the same person or personality as when they were in. We all right. did a lot of stuff we regret when we were in there that you just would not even think or dream of doing today. Yeah. I think most um, most of the people that I can, I mean, you guys, you guys were in the Sea. I was only in the Sea Org for four years officially. I was in, I was an outward trainee at Flag for three years, which as a non Sea Org member, which was the equivalent of being on the FSO TTC. So, been seven years on a Sea Org base, but only four years in the Sea Org. You guys were in for much longer than I was. But in my limited experience, most of the negative interactions that I can recall. It's very easy for me to, to spot that they were being that way at the time because of their post. There, there's only one or two people that truly seem to embrace hurting others. And I, an example of someone who was did some pretty terrible things, but I think is a really good guy, is John Lundeen. <laughs> John Lundeen can be a real cocksucker. <laughs> and he can play the cover your ass game like anyone else. But that's why he survived as a Siri executive for so long, because he was good at that. He's not a bad person. And I won't name the people that I do think are bad people, because no one would know who they are anyway, really. But, you know, someone like John Lundin, he and I came to blows several times. But if I saw him on the street and he said, hey, Aaron, no hard feelings, I'd be like, no hard feelings, man. <laughs> right, right. And probably if he knocked on your door wanting shelter, you'd let him in. Without question, without question. Right. And even the honestly, even the guys that I say are seem to generally be bad people. If they actually showed up asking for help. I wouldn't say no. Right. I'd be like, "All right, we got to talk. <laughs> I'm going to help you, but we got to talk." But when you talk, you then find out what they were going through, and that they're a total different person to how they were reacting at that time. Right. Right. Um, Janice, is there anybody that uh, alive that you know of? Or I should say, who currently alive spent a similar amount of time with L. Ron Hubbard as you did? My sister. Your sisters? Sure. My sister. Okay. Anybody else? Hmm. Not with him directly. I mean, Ken Hook is alive. He was his communicator. So he would be called in for uh, conferences. But he wasn't actually with him in the same space all the time as much as my sister and I. And, and Claire, Claire um, Lowing, Claire Rousseau, she's still actually on the inside in Scientology as public, I believe. She was just recently at the Free Winds with her husband, Rudy. But she was a messenger with uh, my sister and I and Annie. The four of us were, have probably spent the most time with Hubbard than anybody else. So I hope you don't mind if I take a wild segue here. Yeah. Um, since you guys were all girls and you guys were all with him for a really long time, was L. Ron Hubbard a pedophile? No. Not with me, he wasn't. Okay. A any? Do you have any reason to believe he was with anyone else? You know, my si my sister has said that he did try to kiss her once when she was, I think, sixteen. And there was one other messenger who didn't tell me, but I heard it from, from a case supervisor years later that um, there was one time LRH kicked her off of watch and she went down and talked to the case supervisor and told him that LRH was hitting on her. Those are the only two things I know of out of all the young girls, you know, well, um, I mean, a, a 50, 60 year old man trying to kiss a 16 year old girl is not, not good. No, that's not great. That That's disgusting. Okay. And I'm just thankful it wasn't me. Okay. But do you think that, does that, does that instance make him a pedophile? 
Uh, I, you know, I've never looked up the definition of pedophile, but um, probably does. Okay, I get it, I get it. But, you know, you, let me say something, though. There are a lot more guys on that ship that were pedophiles than anybody knows. And a lot of young girls got molested and had nowhere to go or no parent or whatever to go to. So it isn't that everything was hunky-dory and very ethical. No, there is shit that did go down. Pardon right. my French. And was that culture of cover-up back then the same? It, no, it wasn't. It today? was not a cover-up. It was a more of a the kids didn't know where to go or who to go to or who would even care. Really? Because, you know... You're, as a child raised in it, you're a second-class citizen. You know, there is no priority for you. You're kind of like, you're Dev T. Yeah. Okay, I hope you don't mind. I would love to have a more in-depth conversation with you about that at a, at a later time. I don't want to hijack Sure. You, but um, that's that's important. Yeah. Um, is there any, what else do we want to say on this subject of helping people out of the Sea Org, helping people out of Scientology? Um, is it, do you think it is necessary to create some organization in present time that focuses on that effort? You know, if you set that up, you're setting up a big target for fair game. Uh, and anyone going there, I don't think it would be safe for them because it will be knowing who they are and what help they're getting, and they can be fair gamed, where if you keep it more like the underground railway and under the radar, it's much safer for those that leave. So then what is, um, in your opinion, what would you suggest, what is the best way to continue to improve the efficiency, the effectiveness of that process? What can be done to make it better? You know, more of those who want to help just keep staying in touch with each other so that when there are people that leave, their word can be gotten to them, that here's some safe houses that they can go to, or some, like, and Chuck Beatty at one point had tried to get an 800 number, for Sea Org members to contact, you know, and it's it's more of that. It's got to be under under the radar, just for the safety and sanity of those people, so they feel safe and they're given time to destimulate. That is so key: is the destimulation of what they've been going through, and then getting them re-educated or educated as to how to survive in the real world, how to do up a resume, how to set up a bank account. You know, how to go learn to drive. There's people that come out that don't even know how to drive and someone's got to teach them, you know. But, and the more we just kind of spread the word, there is always someone out there or they figure out how to reconnect with somebody at some point. And then, and that's what helps them. Right. With so many, uh, we, we, we covered that um, you can't just throw money at a problem and expect that to make it better. Right. But in many ways, it helps. Right, um, it does. What I, I'd love to know what both of your thoughts are on, in these instances where funds are raised, and I do expect there to be a lot more instances of that. What is the best use of that money? Education. You know, because they can stay with someone else, but you've got to, you got to get them educated. And even if there's an, one person who can be paid in order to help these people and educate them and show them how the computer works, how to, how to Google their name, you know, or how to Google anything to do research and, and how to, yeah, do a resume, where to go, you know, bus money just to go and do their job interviews. Because a lot of these people leave with nothing. Uh, there's one guy, when he left, he had nowhere to go. It was cold at night. He was going to be sleeping on park benches. and then, But he had a little money, so at nighttime, he would get a bus ride and go to the back of the bus. And as the bus went around Los Angeles, he slept at the back of the bus. 
until he then got a job and started getting money to get himself an apartment. That's how he survived in the beginning when he left, but he didn't have anyone or know who to contact. Crazy, crazy. I, uh, let me, uh, a couple of comments on that. Um, one, the point that Janice makes on the decompression is important. And part of the reason I didn't want anyone to know for a very long time, broadly what I was doing was, it needed to be a safe place for them. Um, for, for many years, any time there was a high level defection, I'd have a private investigator coming by my house and my work to see if they were there. You know what I mean? Apparently I had worked with enough people that I was heavily on the radar. Um, and, and there's another thing which is a good deed, you know, does not accolades, but, um, you know, having that, having that calm decompression thing is, is very, very key. Um, in addition to the education as the primary thing, I agree with that, with the addition of also medical. A lot of times they're coming out with horrible dental issues, uh, crashed endocrine system from no sleep, a ton of coffee, uh, you know, a poor diet, um, you know, basic health, basic nutrition, basic uh, exercise. Um, and then part of the education, as Janice mentioned, is catching up on what's happening in the world. How many of them don't know who the president is right now? How many don't know who the uh, vice president is? How many don't know the difference between a Democrat and a uh, Republican? Though I think most Americans know the difference between a Democrat and a Republican. But that's beside the story. Um, you know, what tools are out there in society to help people? There are a lot of social programs, both from uh, NGO non-government organizations and from government organizations. There's a lot of corporations that also have training and education programs that are trying to, to bring people in. So that sort of education is really, really important. I agree that setting up a centralized um, organization is, is setting up something with a target on it. And it's very hard to defend against ongoing. If somebody wants to mess with you, They'll figure out how to mess with you, no matter how clean you are. Um, the, there's not that many people coming out anymore that a network, a casual network or um, social group can't provide the immediate help. And I really believe that there needs to be something more formal put together. And, and this is something I'm willing to help on of education on basic life skills. And let's not just make it for ex-scientologists, let's make it for people. There's a lot of good people in the world that are struggling because they've had bad education from broken families, other religious groups, that type of thing. So if we can use the awareness on Scientology to create something that has a greater good in the world, I think that's a better use of time and efforts. Yeah. True. So, Mike, let me ask you a follow-up question on that. If it is deemed too risky to set up a, 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 a single organization that has a target on it, how would one go about making it more formal? Like, you said we should figure out a way to more formalize it. What does that mean and what would that look like? Um, I'm sure Janice would be willing to help and I would be willing to help. Um, what are you laughing at? No, it's all right. Okay. Um, were you trying to word clear Aaron on the definition of humility? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it, Education, having having people that want to help be able to ask questions on what's it like when I do want to help. You know what I mean? If, if you can create a, a, a more formal network of people that are willing to step forward and 
and then have people that have done work like this, like, you know, Janice, myself, the Headleys, um, Karen de la Carriere, um, actually talk to them about what it takes, what to expect, what's useful, what may not be useful, things to ask for, things to look for. You know, I, I think it has to be a formalizing of understanding for the informal network. Uh, I mean, it, it, it sounds kind of funky, but education, I think, should be free for everyone. I believe education is a basic human right. So if we can create something free that, that helps with the most fundamental of life skills, it may be applicable for other people. You know, I, I can do up some check sheets for that. <laughs> <laughs> and method nine them. And method nine them. <laughs> and then clay demo. We can have group conference Google clay demos. <laughs> Janice, have you ever assigned your children lower conditions? No. They probably they don't even know what it is. I mean, they've, they've heard their stories and stuff, so they'll know from stories. But there's things. It was funny. I thought my daughter would understand everything I was saying, you know, from having grown up with with me. But then when I went to L.A. and I did a slideshow on my book and I was saying things at the end, my daughter puts up her hand. And she's like, what does blah, blah mean? And I was like, she doesn't know. She's been with me all these years and she doesn't know what, you know, it just kind of surprised me. But yeah, so no, my children don't even know what conditions are. If it were not for the TV show, my kids would not even know what the word Scientology meant. Like we've never said a fucking word to them about anything. Right. Well, my kids knew growing up, I'd always said to them, if you get into Scientology, that's your choice. I won't have a problem with it. But if you join staff, all hell is going to break loose. So they always knew that. <laughs> yeah. They'd never be allowed on anyway because of you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, guys, if, if anyone after we're done with this um, thinks of something else that we left off or want to do chapter two or something we want to dive into deeper, um, these chats are fantastic, and I'd love to do it again um, anytime. Cool. Yeah. Well, I'll be gone for a month, but I'm open in December. Cool. Um, anything else you want to say before we uh, wrap up? It was fun. That was Thank fun. You. Awesome. Well, thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. This will, I will publish this not tomorrow, but the day after. Okay. okay, cool. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Have a good night, everyone. You too. Bye-bye.